the cinema of the 70s really started in 1967 with the release of Bonnie and Clyde. We robbed banks. One could argue that we can separate Hollywood into two eras, the era before Bonnie and Clyde and the era after Bonnie and Clyde. Bonnie and Clyde is one of the most revolutionary and groundbreaking movies ever made. It introduced film language never before seen in American cinema and pushed the boundaries for what Hollywood was capable of. The film tells the story of Bonnie and Clyde, two outlaws robbing banks during the Great Depression. Through its daring style, its French-inspired script, and its commentary on both the past and the present, Bonnie and Clyde laid the groundwork for the future, and carved out a space in Hollywood for the experimental and genre-bending films of the 1970s. So let's analyze the opening scene to understand the film's daring and innovative style. The film opens with an extreme close-up on a pair of luscious lips, already suggesting that sexuality will play an important role in the film. Throughout the scene, the camera tracks Bonnie closely. It's a very empathizing way to film a character. The cuts continue following her movement, but they skip over time. In this frame, Bonnie just starts to stand up, but in the very next frame, she's already standing. This happens throughout the scene, maintaining movement, but skipping over time. Because movement is maintained, the cuts feel natural, but the viewer still senses the unease below the surface. Extreme tracking close-ups combined with spatial and temporal disruption convey the tension felt within the character. The camera also reinforces this tension visually by boxing the character into frames within the frame. In one shot, she's stuck inside the bed frame, and another inside the window frame. In this shot, we get visual cues of her juvenile state from the doll and trinkets in the background. And it's not a coincidence that she's standing in front of a birdcage. All these choices seem pretty bold, but the editing is so seamless, the camera work is so precise, and the use of space is so practical that the sequence doesn't feel over the top or confusing. It perfectly conveys that Bonnie feels trapped and uneasy with her life. The editing choices in the opening scene feel self-explanatory for a modern viewer, but this style of editing was actually quite unusual for a Hollywood film at that time. So it's no surprise that director Arthur Penn didn't get his editing inspiration from America. Instead, he borrowed it from a group of innovative filmmakers across the Atlantic. Part of what makes Bonnie and Clyde such a pivotal film was its skillful repackaging of the innovations of the French New Wave for an American audience. The New Wave was a film movement all about breaking genre conventions. These films introduced experimental techniques never used in mainstream cinema, such as discontinuous editing and imaginative, unusual narratives. Journalists David Newman and Robert Benton admired these filmmakers and wanted to bring their innovations to America. So they wrote a screenplay that took the iconic American gangster story of Bonnie and Clyde and injected it with the provocative style of the French new wave. Their initial script borrows heavily from Jean-Luc Godard's Breathless and Francois Truffaut's Jules and Jim. Breathless is also about a couple on the run and ends with a climactic shootout. It has the same editing techniques from Bonnie and Clyde, preserving movement but distorting space and time. Jules and Jim had a similar influence on Bonnie and Clyde. The film centers on an unconventional romance between two men and a whimsical woman, something in an early draft of Bonnie and Clyde. Newman and Benton also infused their script with the relentless pace and dramatic tonal shifts they admired in Jules and Jim. The initial script of Bonnie and Clyde captured what made the wave so exciting and remains in the final film. And Truffaut also influenced the film directly. Benton and Newman sent Truffaut an early draft of the screenplay, and he made many suggestions that made it into the final film. It must have been obvious to Truffaut that the script had more than enough French influence to become an exciting and revelatory revolutionary gangster film, so he focused on making sure the film would not be so unfamiliar to an American audience that it wouldn't make sense to them. Ironically, his input streamlined the script to fit Hollywood norms and removed unnecessary scenes that were meant to reflect the meandering narratives of the French New Wave. As film critic Matthew Bernstein puts it, Truffaut focused not on opening the film up to more playful, disparate elements, but on unifying it to give it greater aesthetic coherence. The opening scene is a perfect example of this idea. Truffaut added this opening scene because the script originally opened opened with Clyde following Bonnie on the street, and he felt that made their meeting too abrupt. Truffaut's addition gives us a stronger understanding of Bonnie's personal conflict that drives the story forward. But at the same time, Arthur Penn shot and edited the opening scene still using French techniques, so we end up with the best of both worlds, a cohesive story that also has the imaginative French influence. So by the time filming started, Penn had the difficult task of shooting a French-inspired script while also making an American audience feel at home. Penn added familiar American imagery through the film scenery, like the FDR post posters and the Oki truck of the family who lost their house to the bank. The mother and child in this scene echo the famous migrant mother photograph. 
Truffaut and Arthur Penn's contributions made the film suitable for an American audience, while the French New Wave influence gave it a brand new style. The result is a groundbreaking film that pushed stylistic and narrative boundaries while still resonating with an American audience. The film's compromise between French influence and Americana resulted in a film that went places no studio-backed film had ever gone in America. The rest of the opening scene shows just how far this film went, challenging Hollywood norms of gender, sex, and violence. When Bonnie catches Clyde trying to steal her mother's car, she speaks the first line in the movie. Hey, boy! What you doing with my mama's car? The screenwriters picked their words carefully throughout the film, and the opening scene is no exception. Addressing him as boy implies his youth and immaturity. In a later scene, we find out he's impotent. His immaturity manifests itself sexually. Right after he first fails to perform, she repeats her initial name for him. Boy. Boy, boy. She may label him as boyish, but that doesn't keep her from admiring his lawbreaking. A simple shot reverse shot tells the whole story. As the script puts it, before they speak, they have become co-conspirators. Bonnie speaking to Clyde from her window evokes the classic Romeo and Juliet balcony scene, but in this version of the story, she's completely naked and he's about to steal her mom's car. They follow a similar star-crossed lover storyline as Romeo and Juliet, but they substitute innocent love for love fueled by violence and criminality. Throughout the film, lawbreaking and violence substitute for sex. Bonnie seductively strokes Clyde's gun, and after Clyde fails at having sex again, she cuddles with the gun. Bonnie and Clyde challenges conventional American storytelling, and in the same way that the opening scene gives us a new, unusual twist to the classic Romeo and Juliet young lovers, the movie as a whole introduced drastic tonal shifting that was brand new for Hollywood. The film challenges expectations in a lot of ways, including its portrayal of the Great Depression and its portrayal of violence. Give me the money. What money, mister? There ain't no money here. Bonnie and Clyde was one of the first movies to portray the Great Depression as kind of funny. <laughs> it was a bang, but we failed three weeks ago. Their getaway chases seem ridiculous in their tiny 1930s automobiles, and they run into humorous mishaps, like not speaking loud enough to get anyone's attention during their robbery. This is the stick up. 1967 feels like the year where just enough time passed after the Great Depression to poke fun at it. Thanks to Bonnie and Clyde, filmmakers continue to have fun with the simple, dim-witted, Depression-era South in movies like Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? But the film doesn't stick to comedy. It creates a nervous imbalance between slapstick humor and violent tragedy. During one robbery, the gang can't find their getaway car because their driver parked, and the mishap is played for laughs. But because of this mistake, Clyde has to kill somebody trying to stop them. The script describes the scene as funny and horrible at the same time. In Pauline Kael's review of the film, she notes that Bonnie and Clyde was the first film to artfully put the audience on the spot. For the first time, we are the butt of the joke. We think we're clever for getting the joke, right until we catch the first bullet right in the face. To make the juxtaposition between comedy and violence work, the film had to push the boundaries for both. Not only was it the first movie to make the Great Depression funny, it was also the first to make violence brutally realistic. It introduced the use of squibs, a small explosive device placed on an actor that made it look like they got hit by a bullet. When characters get shot in the film, we feel the impact, and we see the injuries take a toll on them. This brand new realism enhanced the comedy as much as it enhanced the violence. In one shootout, the realistic and brutal violence makes a gang member's frantic screaming that much more hilarious. Before Bonnie and Clyde, movies always told their stories straight. Dark comedies like Dr. Strangelove had been coming out for years before Bonnie and Clyde, but their satirical tone remained consistent from beginning to end. The juxtapositioning in Bonnie and Clyde opened the door for filmmakers to play with audience expectations towards tone and violence. By 1969, we were already seeing the effects. The extreme violence in The Wild Bunch and the intense irony of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid owe a lot to Bonnie and Clyde. And by the 70s, it was in full swing. Francis Coppola himself copied the brutal realism in Bonnie and Clyde for The Godfather by also using squibs and making the violence feel raw and intense. And any modern movie that plays with emotional expectations owes itself to the revolutionary screenplay of Bonnie and Clyde. Oh, what the fuck's in oh, man. When Marvin gets shot in the face in Pulp Fiction, it feels just like the banker getting shot in the face funny and horrible at the same time. And the juxtaposition of Midwestern niceties and gruesome murder in Fargo feels just like a gang member flailing helplessly in the middle of a shootout. So what's the deal now? Gary says triple homicide? Yeah, it looks pretty bad. So the next time you watch a contemporary American film with drastic shifts in tone, bold editing, or audience challenging storylines, don't forget which couple started it all. We rob banks.
While Bonnie and Clyde did poke fun at Depression-era rural America, it also highlights the desperation people felt during that time. It's partially why Bonnie is willing to join Clyde. She has few other economic prospects as a waitress, and if you want to learn more about this tumultuous time in history, I'd recommend watching the two-part documentary 1929. It's a riveting history of the stock market crash and the Great Depression, and it's only available on CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream's newly expanded library has thousands of titles that will send you down the rabbit hole on topics like art, science, and history. And because they know that these are rapidly changing times, CuriosityStream is offering a 40% discount off annual plans right now. What better way to spend your quarantine days than to expand your mind? And there's more too. CuriosityStream has partnered with Nebula, the creator-owned streaming service that I actually helped build, along with a bunch of other creators you know and love. There, we're posting all of our content ad-free, as well as creating Nebula originals, like the ongoing series working titles. It's a series analyzing TV title sequences, with episodes by Patrick H. Willems, Just Right, and yours truly. And Nebula subscriptions are automatically included with an annual subscription to CuriosityStream. We hope this makes it easier to hashtag stay at home. So if you want to try both CuriosityStream and Nebula free for 30 days, go to CuriosityStream.com slash now you see it and enter the promo code now you see it when prompted during the sign up process. Thanks to CuriosityStream for sponsoring and thanks to you our patrons for your support. If you want to support our work directly, join our Patreon for exclusive benefits. Thanks for watching.